right, Timmy. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna ask you a question. Okay. You just go for it. <laughs> what inspired you to first pick up drumsticks, and what were your first attempts at playing the drums? Well, when I first played the drums, it was, uh, I want to say 60, I want to say 68, 1960. Uh, James Brown had a song called Cold Sweat. You remember Cold Sweat? Yep. And on side two, and back in that day, you flip the record over, you had part two. On part two, it was Give the Drummer Son. And I, I, my, my brother had a band. Um, and the drummer left the drums at the house at my grandmother's house, man. So I just sat out on the drum for a day messing with him and the cold sweat was playing. I'm playing along with directly. Say, give the drummer something. And I swear I played the solo without ever sitting on the drum before. I played the drum solo off of cold sweat. And so I just freaked out. I called my folks and said, you got to come down to mama's house. We called my grandmother mama. And you gotta come down here. Wow, this is deep. Cause I mean, it just felt. I just did it, and I've never played the drum before. Never tried to, and it just came out. That's awesome. Then on that, that's what I did. All right. Yeah. That's awesome. I played keyboards and everything else before. I had a closet full of instruments: flute, violin, upright bass. I mean, I just would get an instrument, stay with it for two, three weeks. And my parents was like, no, we ain't buying no damn drums. <laughs> So that Christmas they surprised me, they rented, rented some drums because their drums were expensive. They weren't going to see another instrument and end up in the closet. So that's actually what made me start. Okay. Start the cold sweat, James Brown cold sweat. Yep. And that kind of goes into the next question, which is, did you take lessons or were you self-taught? I said self-taught. Self-taught, self yeah, self-taught. A lot of, lot of, I listened to a lot of records. And, and we will play along with records all the time. I mean, uh, as to today, that's the way I I like to listen and kind of learn how I'm supposed to feel. So, who who do you say inspired you to learn, like off records? Like, um, who, who did you, who did a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Huh. Uh, James Brown, James Brown, Sly Stone, um, Isaac Hayes, you know, but, um, all that. I mean, Funkadelics. So just all the funk stuff is where I first started. I didn't, I, I didn't swing anything until it seems like the middle of the 80s. I didn't know nothing about swing. I was a funk drummer, yeah, for years. Yeah, I was a funk drummer. I never, never knew nothing about no swing. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Never, never, never. And so how, okay, well, you spent 21 years with the late, great Jimmy Smith. Right. Tell us about your first encounter with him. Oh, Especially Lord. if you're a funk drummer, how did you? Well, actually, I started. Well, let's, tell, let's talk about the first encounter. Okay, the first encounter, oh, Lord. Uh, I had a van. Yeah. And there's a, there's a cat in town named Mose Davis. He owned the organ, so Jimmy was coming to town. That was Mose's idol, actually. Mose Davis' idol was uh, Jimmy Smith, you know. So, uh. Hallelujah, as soon as I tell this story. <laughs> um, so, so Jimmy Smith, uh, we, we delivered the organ, so I said, Mr. Smith, uh, and my father, I mean, he played all these jazz records as I was growing up, so I knew who these people were, and I, and I knew how it was supposed to feel, so by that time I started trying to play a little jazz. So I go, Mr. Smith, can I just play one song at the sound check? So please, I delivered the organ. We joked, he was wild too. He had a crazy sense of humor. Mr. Smith, can I just play one song? He said, no problem, no problem. So uh, as they set up, and he called me up to play one song at the sound check. And his wife was his manager. They looked at each other and said, oh, oh yeah. And it, it, the rest was history. I've been with him for 21 years after that. Wow. Yeah, at, at a sound check. Just said, may I please? Yeah, you know, we hung out. Uh, actually, myself and Russell Malone. And we went in every night at that performance, that Pascal's the care so We went in every night, man. And Jimmy, as soon as we walked through the Jimmy Jackson, Russell. He called us up on stage right away. I mean, I don't think the rest of the band was real happy with us at that time. I mean, the rest of his band. <laughs> but I mean, we go up there and we played this jam with him. We ended up doing some road things. Actually, there's some pictures in there with uh, me and Russell with him. 
Yeah, no, good. So did you get the gig with him? Pretty well, much. Well, actually, I got the gig with. Well, not really. I decided to move out to California. I moved to California. They had promised us, promised me the gig. When I, you know, and then they thought about it. The drummer they had was an incredible drummer, Frank Wilson. He, he was a good friend of mine. He's a great drummer. And um, they were like, well, he ain't done nothing wrong. We can't just fire him. Which I really respected that out of them saying, we just can't fire him. He, he ain't done it. And then there was a time just happened where I got in, and then I was with him for a minute. Was it, what was it like for you to play, grow up playing funk and then make the switch over to play well, straight? Well, actually, again? funk and swing, it's not that much different. It's like the way it's supposed to feel. Funk is more on the two and four swing is the two and four goes to the hi hat and then the cymbal. I mean, it's not a backbeat like like funk, which some some swing is. I mean, some swing is like a shuffle. That's that's a two and four backbeat. I mean, it's not that big of a difference once you understand that it's not that big of a difference. Before you understand it, then you you confused and you blow on the swing because you're trying to. Make this different, but it, music is just a feeling. It's the way, the way you make it feel. You try to make it feel right. I mean, but you know, a lot of a lot of straight ahead guys are very anti. Well, so. a lot of them can't play funk. That's, <laughs> That's what, what I, I mean. mean. I mean, some of, a lot of them, those that can play funk. I mean, you can play them both incredibly. Herbie Hancock, uh, right. Harvey Mace. Um, um, you know, numbers of Bernard Purdy, uh, Idris Muhammad. I mean, we're talking about drummers. I mean, uh, when it comes time to swing, they swing and when it's time to funk, there's some funk going down. I mean, so that's, there's a lot, most of the guys that are tripping about the funk is because they really ain't got the funk down. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you know, and, same, and vice versa about some of them that don't like jazz because they can't swing. But they're great fun players. I mean, but the most great musicians to play whatever they I was watching Simon and Garfunkel at Central Park. And I look up and there's Grady Tate playing drums at Central Park to the concert. And it's two drummers. It's Steve Gadd and, uh, and Grady Tate. And I'm like, wow. You know, the Grady Tate one of the masters. Yeah. As a matter of fact, that's my idol. I talked to him the other day. I talked to him last summer. Uh, that's Friday. That's what I'm talking about. Where's he at? Where's he at? He's in New York. He's in New York. Yeah. Tell him you're going to get up there. I told him I'm, I'm trying to get up there. And he, come on, come on. And, you know, we talked We talked about Jim, losing Jimmy. And, you know, I didn't, it wasn't a long conversation. He, he was at a club. I so happened to call a friend that, that uh, Ernest Gregory. I called Ernest Gregory. He said, I'm sitting here looking at, at uh, Kenny Washington and Grady Tate sitting here. I'm like, put Grady on the phone. And it was just so happened I talked to Grady that night. Yeah. Well, so what was your full 21 years with Jim Smith like? Crazy. Wow. Uh, got to see the world. It was a, it was a pretty pretty incredible ride. He was he was a nut, and I'm, I'm a nut, but <laughs> I think he taught me a lot about being a nut. But, but uh, musically, it was like a bunch of shuffle, a bunch of swing, a bunch of blues. I mean, uh, he taught me how to less is more and how to rock a house. I mean, just how to. You know, you don't have to play all all that you got right at that time. You just rock. There's a groove that he, he taught me about just a solid lay it down, and make people feet tap, and just just the house rocking type of thing. It was an incredible rock. I, I, when, when we talk about this, I mean, so many flashes. I mean, from so many different places. You know, he he. Um, you know, Jimmy was a legend. He was a little bitter because, you know, they never gave him the credit that he deserved. Uh, he, he was the world's greatest. And, um, he, he got his first, Hammond finally gave him his first B3. And uh, maybe two years, maybe 
two years or maybe the year before he died. Well, Hammond gave his first CD. I'm not trying to knock anybody in, but this is the truth. No, this is the, it's a little late. Yeah, I'm talking about they gave him his first, and if it wasn't for Joey DeFrancisco working the deal, he, they wouldn't have gave him that. Wow. But he he had uh, he's so singly responsible for millions of Hammonds being sold. Wow, yeah, oh yeah, oh God, yeah. He, he took the Hammond out of the black church and made it for jazz. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, without a doubt. Yeah. He, used to, he was the king. And, you know, everybody knew it. But, I mean, so he, so he was bitter behind some things like that. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would yeah. be too. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. What was, uh, what was your proudest moment with him? Like, Plane was. Um, <clears throat> wow, it was the Heritage Festival. I can't, I'm trying to think of what year that was. The Heritage Festival, man, it was like incredible. It was um, the one time that we normally joke and laugh and have all kind of jokes on the way to the gig. It was weird. It was some kind of spirit. Well, we, we, nobody said anything. Cora Silvers was in the uh, limo with us. And Carl Burnett, his drummer, and me, uh, Carl and myself have been good friends for a while. We're sitting there quiet, and, and only two people, I think, was me and Carl talking to two drummers. You know, we, it's hard to shut us up. But, and next thing I know, next thing I know, it was incredible. It was incredible, man. We hit the stage, and it was boom. It was, uh, it was like, boom. I thought it was going to pass out, it was so hot. Next thing I know, this breeze comes, and I'm like, ooh, and then next thing I know, it just pours rain, boom, so everybody had to get under the tent real tight, and next thing you know, the party was on, man, and anybody that was at that concert will know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, everybody else was recording, uh, Jimmy and his wife, or his wife, or whoever made that decision, would let them record us. And we were like, uh oh, a big mistake. But some things aren't to be recorded. Some things are for, for the, you know, for your memory. For your memory. For yeah. People yeah. experience. Those that were there. Those that exactly were I'm talking about. <clears throat> All right. Um, performing with a legend such as Jimmy Smith, you're bound to come in contact with playing with many other great uh -huh. artists. Tell us about some of your encounters on the road with other musicians. <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, that, I could go on for hours. Yeah. Oh, playing with Jim. <clears throat> I got to be Kurt Fuller. I got to be Herbie Hancock. And so, I mean, this, I got to make music with Wink Marcel. Let's see. We're playing in Japan, and Wink comes out whispering in my ear. You think the old man mine? I said, man, go get your horn. But see, me and Jimmy had a rapport where. We had like this real kind of routine on stage because both of us were crazy. So there was a lot of comedy going on too. I mean, we did the show because we have this interaction going. And it was it was incredible. Uh, actually, I got I have some videos that that you can just see. Me and Jimmy had this whole this little lock thing we had together. It was incredible. We all had certainly had a chemistry. Oh man, it was I mean it was chemistry from the first day. Yeah. From the first day because he he uh, he asked me something. I said um. Uh, he said, who you, who you talking to? I said, you motherfucker. And he said, who you calling motherfucker? I said, you motherfucker. He said, I like you. I like you. That's what we got to be with. I'm serious. I did, did see it. Yeah. I mean, we had to beep that, I guess. <laughs> but that's the way we, that was the first day that we met. And he said, who you calling? I said, you. And he's like, I like you. Because he would see if he could scare you. If he could scare you musically on stage, he would do that too. He would throw this stuff out here and see if he could scare you and lose you. And he would see how strong he was by doing it. If he could say, okay, yeah, I can go there, I can hear that. And that was the key to so playing with Jimmy, is being able to hear because anything could happen. He never called a song. He never would say what we're playing. He would just go boom, start. And your ears had to be ready. You had to beat it. There were so many tunes I didn't, had never heard before. Because Jimmy had over 200 albums. 200, 250 albums. I, I didn't know half the songs, but you had to open them ears up and, and 
that was the, the that's one of the things you had to do with Jimmy Smith. You had to have big old ears. Man. You said you never rehearsed, right? Never rehearsed. Never rehearsed. Never rehearsed. Never rehearsed. Never rehearsed. And it would, it would be real tight. <laughs> I mean, I never rehearsed, especially as a band. Every once in a while, man, Jimmy, after a gig, we go and, and jam. Well, actually, after after the gig, we go jam more than we played at the concert. We go to different clubs, and, and mostly every place we was at, and played more than we played at the concert. I mean, wow. it, that was that was one of our things we would do. Sometimes managers would get kind of pissed at us because they'd be like, "Hey, y'all, you know, that's just what we like to do: go out and like to meet people." And we had best friends all over the world. I mean. How do you meet these friends? I don't know. They're just all over the world. I mean, Australia. I remember Mario's in Australia. There's a club called Mario's in, in Melbourne, Australia. That since I'm, I'm thinking now, for some of the, they had a place called the Basement in uh, Australia. They were really good people. I mean, there's a place called Bourbon Street in, in uh, it's the Brazil yeah, Palace. Yeah. And I'm saying, it, those people are just, <coughs> just like we know them all our life. We got that. So. It's happening. Yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, you're stepping up to the plate as a leader of your own group. Tell us about your debut CD release on my way home. Well, I, um, I'm trying to figure out what took me so long. But working with Jimmy, um, I guess I never thought about him leaving us. Once he left us, it's like, okay, well, he's gone. I'm not gone. I've got to get busy here because I don't want to be stuck as a local musician in any town for the rest of my life. I mean, I, so I, I would cut it up with him in mind a lot, which you can tell if, when you listen to CD. I mean, he's never seen the CD. He's, uh, you know, uh, his, I can feel spirit when I was recording. When then, uh, I'm just real proud of him. And, and I, I decided to take it. An album that uh, my father played, and it was one of my favorite albums as a kid. I loved the sound of jazz, I just didn't understand it. Uh, I thought it was crazy music. <laughs> as a kid, I really thought it was crazy. I thought it was crazy music. I told Jimmy Smith that too. I said, I told my daddy one time, walking the wild, I said, Daddy, that's crazy music. That's just crazy. And he said, One day, my father said, One day. And I ended up playing it. But, uh, Cannonball Alley Dance Who was uh, the, the album that he uh, introduced Nancy on that so that's why I did a lot of copy songs off that uh, which tried to put my twist on my own twist but that's it was just one of my favorite albums all through my life mm. since I was a little kid I mean it just sounded right Nancy was Cannonball I mean what can you say so that's why I try, I didn't try to copy it like they did it because it, it was in stone the way they did it, it not like it's not like you gonna do it like they did it. And you put your own stamp. Yeah, you got to do it your own way. Uh -huh. uh, you got to change some stuff up because you, I mean that you ain't gonna cut that. Ain't, or, I mean it was done. They they killed it. I mean that's one of my favorite albums. I hope that my CD sells a lot of their CDs too again because that that stuff that really needs to be jazz doesn't get old. Real real good music it doesn't have to just be jazz. Pink Floyd. Uh, uh, Dark Side of the Moon, that'd never get old. Never, ever, ever. Marvin Gaye, what's going on? It'll never get old. I mean, um, Cannibal Alley, Nancy Wilson, I'll never be old. It's always fresh. Man. So, from, you know, so that's, that's what, what I'm trying to do, just make some music that'll last, you know, mm -hmm. like these other folks. Hopefully, mine will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk, speak of that, let's talk about your creative process. Um, how do you approach arranging standards and and or writing original music? And do you compose from the drums or do you use piano? Oh, or mostly piano. Yeah. I, I was a, 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 actually I played the B three before I ever touched. You know. I played B three in church. I played piano. Well, we used to have to take piano lessons when I was a kid. Oh, yeah. So yeah, I, I, any I think any musician needs to understand the piano so you understand form, understand a voicing. Uh, I, I think all musicians need to understand the piano. I don't care what you play. I really, I, mean, I, really, I really feel that. That I, I, I mean, might not be true, but I feel that. But yeah, I, I, um, 
actually, the CD I cut, actually the arrangements didn't go down until I had an idea of what I wanted to do, but it, not, it didn't happen until the night before we went to the studio. We were sitting there in the cats, George Sessoms, uh, and myself and William Knowles. We were sitting in the living room and uh, we were rehearsing, and I'm like, no, they did that already. And then, boom, then that idea would come right then. That was the day before we cut. And, and uh, with the musicianship they had, I mean, we made that turn and then uh, went to the studio on all, all those tracks, our first takes. Mm. Every one of those tracks, we had one rehearsal before we went to the studio the night before. And I took them all out to the strip bar after we got them in here. And then we got them the next day. And then, uh, and then uh, I mean, and, and that's what happened with that project. Serious, serious business. This is the truth. <laughs> yeah, so it, ha yeah, it worked itself. <laughs> um, okay, <clears throat> so what other types of music or artists do you drive this to? Get inspiration from oh classical, uh, gospel, lots of gospel. Uh, I like all kind of music. I'm mean, very honest. I love all kinds of music. It's ironic to the question you just asked, and then the music that just played a lot of Brazilian stuff. Oh, I love it. It can't be. If, if there's some way I can come back and be over there for the rest of my life, I'm there in Puerto Rico, I don't care either one of them. Jesus Christ. Just the music, the feel, just the warmth of, of the music. I love all kind of music. I mean, rock, I like rock and roll. I love, uh, uh, I love, I mean, Jay Giles band, all that kind of stuff. I mean, I love all, all music. Mm -hmm. Funk, especially old funk, Ohio players. You know, it's just, just so much good music. And I have a hard time sometimes putting it in a category because it's they call good music and bad music. I just really feel like that. Mm. My family. That's great. Um, what's the most important bit of advice you were given by another musician or artist? Uh, most important advice. Uh, don't try so hard. You know, where you where you trying to get to? I mean, just slow it down. Just relax. Let it groove. Uh, you 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 trying off hard, this huh? <laughs> Just let, it, just let it play. You can play. I can hear you can play, but you, you're trying so hard, you, you're clouding it all up. Uh -huh. mm, yeah. What one piece of equipment would you advise all drummers to own? What piece of equipment? All drummers. Plus the drumsticks. <laughs> I guess that's a good yeah. you know. yeah. <laughs> All right. you know. That's kind of a trick question. Alright. Well, okay. And you probably you already kinda of hit on this, but what's your was your proudest playing moment? That was the Heritage Fest? Heritage Fest. Yeah. yeah. Let me think of I would have to say the Heritage Festival. It, that was the highlight of my of my entire life playing music, this beer that was there. Uh, you know, that, that festival was incredible anyway. I hope it can come back. It is, this starting again in May. Yeah, but yeah, I hope it can come back. I mean, you know, it's, uh, yeah. it's too bad that we could have picked up a lot of that, but I'm not here for that. So. <laughs> okay, what's been the biggest disaster, the biggest disaster you've ever had on stage, and how did you cope with it? The biggest disaster on stage. Biggest disaster. Like Valentine's Day was. No, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, biggest disaster. <laughs> I guess that's, that's a, okay. I guess when I was a little kid, before I learned, I mean, I, I would go sit in. You know, I'd be going wild. So I bust this guy's uh, bass drum, and I'm like, oh lord. Because I'm just a, I'm a wild kid. I'm just bang, 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 bang. And so I bust this bass drum. And here they got the rest of the show to do. And I had, so I had to run home, get, take my bass drum head off my bass drum. I'm, I'm, I could have been born in 17, 18. No, I'm younger than that, probably. Yeah, but that, that was probably about the biggest one I can remember. I think that's my biggest one. 
Um, do you warm up before a concert? Or no, a gig? no, 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 I should not I just, uh, normally I pray before, mm. before I, uh, you know, and actually I, we get away from that, which uh, that might be my problem sometimes. But I would always take, take a minute, meditate, say a prayer, and then, you know, let the music play. I don't. I don't even try playing because it's not me anyway. I feel it's, I'm just a, a tool. That, you know, God makes music. It's not us. It's, it's a tool. And, and to say that prayer first gives him the channel that he needs to not be thinking. Now, of course, you have to have your chops up and all that. I mean, but sometimes there's things when the music's playing right that you can do stuff that you can't even practice. You can't do stuff that the music that have chops, your chops up to a place where you can't even rehearse when the music's playing. You gotta let the music play. That's that's what I need to do. That's great advice. Um, well, that pretty much answers the next one. What's the most important, important bit of advice you could give to new drummers? Um, if someone was just starting out as a new drummer. Just starting out? What would you say? Oh, uh, practice. Starting out, yeah. You can practice. So, uh, try, try to come up with a concept of time. Because it's not about the chops. It's about the way the music flows. It's about time. You can have a guy that play all the stuff, and if you ain't got that groove, you're not good for the band. You want to be by yourself, or if you like, you can, have, you can go off all you want. But, <laughs> but I'm just saying, you, you have to have that groove. You have to find the flow. You have to let the music flow. You, you can't, you know. You, you follow? <laughs> Okay, well, that pretty much concludes this. Uh, thanks for your time, consideration. Okay. Is there any last thoughts for uh, listeners and readers? Uh, hope they enjoy my CD, and, and I hope they have a lot more to come. I really do. Uh, I just hope, hope that this project, you know, can touch some people. I really hope so. I mean, because it, it definitely was was magic happening. I feel uh, a lot of people say they really dig it. Hope a lot more people dig it too. Well, I think it's uh, it's awesome, man. So okay. I'm sure there's going to be many more. All right. Well, <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, man. Great job.